Comencem ara la sessió sobre la taula rodó. Finalment, vam començar la discussió a la taula rodó sobre la setmana de la setmana i el dret a la digital desconexió. Bona tarda. To this uh, discussion, this round panel, uh, round table on the four day week and the right to digital disconnection, as I said. Both are concepts that are closely related with the uh, our organization of our time and our work. And the pandemic, in that sense, has accelerated changes which a few months ago, two years ago, seemed out of the question. And this is what has happened. In this context, uh, we, we, it's now time to have the debate. First of all, the need with the pandemic and confinement, uh, uh, there was a parental need to mm, change our, mm, our timetables to maintain uh, production activity. We had to uh, take decisions to continue maintaining economic activity. And I am talking, the first thing that comes to mind is teleworking, remote working. What a few years ago seemed something out of science fiction, we're talking a lot of, of uh, teleworking. We are more or less prepared for telework. And with the pandemic, this has become a reality in many enterprises. Uh, this uh, was almost uh, man mandated, it was, it was done, uh, uh, an emergency solution, but now it's become the norm in many companies. And we have also, we usually have hybrid models. The question is that now we're at this moment when the pandemic is still out there, let's not trick ourselves, but we're beginning to emerge. And people, some people think that we're almost out of, the, out of the woods. But will these changes continue? what awaits us in the future? That's one question which is clear. And that sense, we, the first question, which is the four-day week. Is it the future or not, the four-day week? What are the uh, pros and cons? What, uh, who are defended, who are against it? That is the matter under discussion today. What impact will they have on, the, uh, on productivity, on the health and well-being of, of, of workers? What experiences exist which could be a pointer to reality? And, and, would that, and, and what have uh, those who experience it, what do they think? Is this step necessary to move towards, uh, uh, if you like, uh, um, mm, managing to combine our family life and our life at work, and all these changes, which I'm sure are here to stay, have also put on the table a different debate, a different discussion on the need uh, for digital disconnection. It's a right of workers. Is it there? Should it be regulated? What happens, uh, what are the steps being taken to carry out digital disconnection? Another uh, discussion today concerning all these changes which are taking place uh, concerning times, uh, work, and so on. And we shall be listening to a series of uh, speakers, uh, experienced speakers, and we'll attempt to find answers. Maybe more questions will arise. And we'll uh, attempt to have a debate, a discussion on pros and cons. Um, the speakers, today's speakers, I'm going to uh, announce them, and then I'll welcome them one by one, uh, introduce them, and each of them will have a few minutes, a brief minutes, to explain the position they have uh, to these two questions. I'm going to uh, announce them. Camila Kring is an author on applied chronobiology. She, uh, she will also participate. We'll also, we also have Tony Mora, who's sitting next to me. He is the president of the uh, Social and Economic Sense in Barcelona. Uh, uh, then we have um, a, uh, um, Charlotte 
Joaquin Pérez Reyes, Secretary of State for Employment of the Spanish Government. Alex Aki is a member of the European Parliament. Uh, Manana Galing, Director of Employment and uh, Skills in DG Employment at the European Commission. Uh, and Tony Moraes, Head of President of the Economic and Social Council of Catalonia. So, the first question to kick off this uh, round is for Camila Kring. She is author and expert in applied chronobiology, founder of the B Society Foundation. Good morning to you. What to you a keynote uh, speech about um, the future of work in relation to time, and I will just uh, share my presentation with you. So this will be more over all. I will not go into the four week uh, or four four day work week and I'm also the right to disconnect. I will speak more in general about the future of work in relation to time. I have a background in engineering, a PhD in work life balance. And in the last 16 years, I've been working with creating flexible working cultures in 17 countries. And I'm author of five books and one is in English, four in Danish. If we look in the society in general and this uh, transition from the industrial society to today's society, in the industrial society, we had a lot of similarities in our family form, work form, work with them, and, and also workplace. In today's society, we have many family constellations. We have many work forms and many work with them and different workplaces. So we're moving from this one size fits all to one size fits one. So this evolution of work from cow to computer, we still have a lot of mindset, even <laughs> from the agrarian society, early to bed and early to rise that makes a man healthy, wealthy and wise. Um, a study from Washington University shows that even if you show up early at a workplace, you get higher performance evaluation than if you start later. From the industrial society, we have this mindset about working nine to five and also the eight hour workday from 1919, industrial comparison principle that if I'm working eight hours, then you should also work eight hours. And in today's society, we can work 24 seven also with technology uh, that makes it possible for us to work anytime and anywhere. And it's also about time to renegotiate social practice and maybe say goodbye to some of the old rhythms from the industrial society with this 888 model from 1919. Eight hours of working, eight hours of, of uh, spare time and eight hours of, of sleeping. And if we look into the management also from the industrial society, we say that the first uh, management theory in the world was Friedrich Winslow Taylor with the principles of scientific management. And in this book and this management theory, he says that workers are dumb and lazy. Therefore, rules, control, system and discipline are necessary. He also said in the future, the system must be first. But in today's society, work is more an activity. It's not a place. So we are in this uh, transition, I would say, in our mindset. We still have a lot of rhythms in our societies, from the agrarian society and also from the industrial society. And how can we unlock the industrial clocks? Because in the industrial society, 80% of a company's value was material. It was buildings and machines. Um, and we had this collective work design and clock time sell you hours to the industrial men. But in today's society, we have over 80% of a company's value is immaterial. And therefore, it also makes sense with individual life design and choose time and spaces where you work best. And that's actually what I call chrono leadership. It's a combination of chronobiology and leadership. <laughs> so where we in the industrial society had this time battle um, between working times and, and free times, I believe that the new time battle in today's society is about working more in sync with our biological clock. And chrono leadership is about planning working hours more so they match our circadian rhythms. 
In 2017, it was three chronobiologists who won the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine. And it was a huge recognition for the research area in chronobiology. And chronobiology is about our biological clocks. You are born with a biological clock, your mm. biological rhythm, when you sleep and when you awake. It's not something you choose. And from the researchers of chronobiology, uh, we define or, or see the distribution of chronotypes. It's uh, split into seven categories from extreme early chronotypes. It's people who go to bed early and get up early. And, uh, and then you have the moderate early chronotypes, the light early chronotypes, and then an intermediate type where you're not early and not late, and then light um, late chronotype, uh, moderate um, late chronotype, and extreme late chronotype. So you have the data here. If you look into a population, you can see there are much more late chronotypes in our society, but our society primarily support uh, the early chronotypes, uh, and that's historical reason with uh, this uh, nine to five society. Huh. So actually, we should also implement later starting times in schools and also later times starting times at workplaces. It will improve people's health, well-being, and also uh, productivity. If we look into people's um, what's going on in the body of human beings. Uh, then we can see that the biological clock is actually the conductor in your body. Uh, we have a, a master clock in our brain. It consists of 20,000 cells, and it's regulating your hormone level, um, your body temperature, and also your cognitive performance. And here you can see the differences in a moderate early chronotype and a moderate late chronotype. What I really find fascinating is when you go into the moderate early chronotype, you can see that the start of the melatonin level uh, increases very early in the evening. And that's why early chronotypes, I call them A persons, go to bed early and get up early. Some A persons can go directly from, uh, from bed to work and you have this strongest cortisol release early in the morning. Uh, so it really makes sense for A persons to start working early in the morning. If you are a moderate B person, a moderate late chronotype, you can see that the melatonin level increases around midnight. So that's why if you are a late chronotype, you can't just go to bed uh, very early in the evening and sleep. It's very normal for a late chronotype to go to bed later and get up later. But the problem is that over 80% of our population are woken up by an alarm clock to fit in to the rhythms of society, this nine to five society, and the time architecture designed in the agrarian society and also in the industrial society. So it is about time that we start to create new time rhythms and time architecture in our society, supporting our different biological rhythms because late chronotypes have 10% higher risk of dying than early uh, chronotypes. We see that in a huge study from 2018. And it's just because of uh, the time structures in our society. Disruption of your biological clock can also lead to increased risk of cancer. A new study published here this summer. So if we are matching working hours to our, our internal clock, this is a study published by bodyclock.health. Oh, it's an unpublished uh, study. I just uh, received the data where they are working with shift workers. And 20% of the global workforce are shift workers. And it makes sense to match working hours to our internal clocks. For example, if you are early chronotype and you have a night shift, you can't go home and sleep in because a person's early chronotypes always wake up early. If you are a late chronotype, it will be more suitable, for example, to work uh, in the afternoon or, or evening. And if you are an extreme late chronotype, it could be beneficial for you also to work night hours. But just by changing the working times for those shift workers, and it could be 30 minutes, it could be 60 minutes, it could be remove one shift. They saw those uh, very impressive results. Uh, with the health of the employees. And the bodyclock.health has uh, 
develop a method where they can actually just by some examples of hair roots calculate your chronotype. Uh, and it's uh, on an RNA test. Uh, it's genetic also. You're born with this chronotype. It's not something you choose. Hmm. So my conclusion also in this presentation um, for the future of work is that we need to fight for chronotype equality. There's a lot of discrimination against the uh, genetic biological rhythms in our society. And we have to implement later starting time in schools and university, for example, and also include chronotype as a part of the Charter of Fundamental Rights. Um, if you look into um, the different rhythms in our young people, we can see that in the time where we are young and take our education, it's a time where we are very late chronotypes. All research shows that. And it is, it is because of the hormone testosterone that is both in men and women. So men are most late chronotype when they're 21 years old, and women are most late chronotypes when they're 19 and a half. And it really doesn't make sense that we start our education system very early in the morning. We are trying to give them knowledge at times where they're actually in the middle of their biological night. So let us create education system for human beings instead of putting them, them in to some rigid time structures from the agrarian society and also from the industrial society. A later starting time, research shows that a later starting time gives the students more sleep and also higher grades. And then we have to implement chronotype into our non-discrimination paragraph. And maybe it's already there because there is uh, standing genetic features. And from the research of chronobiology, we now know that you are born with a biological clock. It's not something you change or, or you can change. Um, so therefore, human beings should be before system. And it makes sense to match working hours to human beings' biological clock. Thank you very much. Thank you, Camila. Very interesting. Um... Thank you very much. Most interesting. Most interesting, uh, uh, this debate uh, related to our working times. Uh, I think you put on the table a very interesting point, uh, positive discrimination, and something we cannot change. Maybe that's where we've got to go, we've got to move towards. That is, that is most interesting. Let's continue with the debate. And then we'll, we'll go back to that, right? If it's time to talk about education, as Camilo was saying, in enterprises, in companies, and how to bear all that in mind. Many people who are listening to Camilo probably feel identified with one of those types. It's inevitable, Tony. Uh, we were listening and thinking, well, am I an early uh, chronotype? Um, I, a later one, what about my kids? Uh, uh, so it's something to do with our lives and we have to uh, uh, tweak all that to have a healthier life and a more productive life. Uh, so we shall continue with the debate. Uh, Tony Mora, you are the president of the Economic and Social Council of Barcelona. Good morning. What uh, did you think of what Camila said? It's, uh, is it fairly logical to identify with one type or another? Well, we were saying that we were either uh, swallows or owls, right? Um, uh, when it came to our sleeping hours. I don't know if that's, we, if that's where we're going towards. Now, Tony, <clears throat> changes in working organization or organization of, of, our, of, of our work are taking place. But sh will they also lead to a change in uh, uh, regulation, in laws? What steps are taking place right now in this sense? in terms of regulation. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you on behalf of the Social Economic and Work Council of, Bas of Catalonia. Uh, we are cooperating directly with the association. And uh, this is going to be the beginning of a long friendship, as uh, the film Casablanca mentioned. But your question, Nuria, going back to that. I think that we are living uh, in interesting times, as Confucius said. And that's the end of quotes from me. 
Right, so uh, complicated times, certainly, uh, during the pandemic, post-pandemic, difficulties which are compelling all of us to uh, be nimble in our ways, in our, a change in our ways of thinking and ways of acting from our different responsibilities. If we look at the work, world of work, we are seeing a, a very steep learning curve we are undergoing through and a social, uh, um, if you like, partners, an like extraordinary course in negotiating, but even quicker and more agile. And when it comes to this world of work, which have emerged today, teleworking, which have come up today, and dis uh, digital disconnection, the four day, the four day week, being able to change things quickly because the world is moving forward and we need that. I think that this climate will lead us to think everything has to be regulated. Let's approve laws uh, quickly. Well, uh, it's all very well. Administration and decision makers do have responsibility in their parliaments and so on at uh, different levels to actually uh, implement their policies and their desiderata and to ensure that uh, changes in society aren't that far removed from the legal framework. But I represent the Social Economic and Work Council of, of Catalonia and as a president we should defend and, uh, and claim collective bargaining. Right? And in that sense, collective bargaining, which sometimes is slower, sometimes is faster, but they are, we, we are seeing a lot, of a, a lot of steps forward. Collective bargaining is, is often not known, not that familiar to society. They don't know the, the ins and outs of it. And within social dialogue, they will be reflected, but in the day-to-day -day bargaining in industry, uh, there are important steps forward. And in that sense, I do think we should be transparent in our council, amongst other things, and well, one of my main tasks is to um, give, draw up opinions with, when it comes to drafting laws. And we recently presented an opinion on trends at the workplace and uh, within, um, and how the, the perception of time is taking place. And the interesting points, uh, there has been a diagnosis of 154 conventions, and many of them were pre-pandemic, uh, which are beginning to use, and many of them uh, had to do with the day-to-day -day of the pandemic. And language is changing. Uh, we, it is appropriate to talk of, uh, if you like, um, uh, 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 um, ensuring telling world of work and the family, but looking at co-responsibility uh, gender co-responsibility of, of housework, uh, uh, has to do with different ways of living together, uh, and that has an impact or knock-on effect on collective bargaining. And for me, it's interesting. It shows that we are all carrying out this exercise of learning pretty quickly. Right now in Catalonia, we are looking at the interprofessional agreement in Catalonia, the collective bargaining process. Uh, uh, the one that's currently in force, but it has to be renewed, the one goes up to 2020. And uh, social partners are also uh, discussing these things and putting them on the table. Collective bargaining affects everyone, almost everyone, and covers, uh, but there are many areas where collective bargaining agreements or collective agreements are weak, and it, it is important to have a collective umbrella, if you like. Uh, this defense of collective uh, bargaining uh, is, is also important to look at beyond uh, uh, the actual negotiating table. Sometimes we, uh, we say that the government of Catalonia and the government of Catalonia should uh, introduce laws on this or that. Well, workers and their representatives, their legal representatives, uh, the most representative trade unions, uh, and um, company representatives every day are drawing up rules which modify and condition the lives of people uh, 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 positively, in a sense. And I don't wish to, to evade the issue, but we have seen flexibility agreements which have been negotiated concerning working week as has never been done before based on the needs of uh, teleworking and remote working during the pandemic. 
and the productive needs of the company. And this permeability has been much greater than in other spaces. And it's a path that we have to continue, uh, uh, we continue along this track. The government of Spain and the government of Spain and the previous ones and the future ones know well that within the world of work you cannot move on and the director general will uh, uh, change me unless there is consensus with social partners. And you can go without an agreement with social partners, the rule at the end of day won't be successful or be weak and leads to a distortion of the social climate, which is not good for anyone. We in the social, uh, in our social council, and the same applies to the one in Spain, has this obligation uh, we, which we feel we must move by consensus. It seems difficult, it seems slow, but sometimes we do things, uh, we are moving forward. Sometimes by attempting to be too hasty, uh, you don't, you, you sort of, uh, uh, you're not really successful. One point which Camila has said to, uh, it's like a historical view of the working day, very interesting, uh, very enlightening, and it's really this reference to 888, eight hours day, eight hours rest, eight hours uh, 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 leisure. It's very much a Barcelona thing. And I, we go back to 1919 to the big strike of La Canadenca factory, and it was a social achievement. It was very, very important at that time. Uh, and now uh, we're talking of the uh, chance of, of um, cutting back the working day, uh, w sharing work, face-to-face uh, uh, -face work or in-person work and remote work uh, and a four-day week. But let us not forget, this was a very important social achievement, the 888. I had it written down anyway. But Camilla has got it, I'd like to thank her for that. And it's an example of what we're attempting to do, how we can move forward. And you don't need a general strike like the one in 1919 at La Canadenca to reach agreement. But uh, it is true that experiences, uh, four day experiences, which are extant. Uh, uh, there is an example, as I was telling you before we started, which we are well aware of from the press the example of Desigual, the Desigual. A uh, clothing factory in the factory in Barcelona, the work centre in Barcelona, has reached to an agreement by a referendum amongst workers, and the conclusion is that for the four-day week would be applicable. There hasn't been an agreement between the workers' representatives and the management. That is true, because there are certain aspects which uh, don't fit in with the company culture. But, uh, and that does, is a distorting element. And, uh, and uh, uh, sometimes people aren't, aren't keen to express their views if it goes it flies against the grain. Uh, there are certain much I'd like to defend. Collective bargaining uh, must reach all companies, even the smallest one. If this agreement had been adopted with the legitimacy of a collective agreement with representatives from management and from workers, from the workforce, uh, it would be a lot more powerful, a lot more robust uh, than many other examples. I'm talking the the the, the I'm talking the will, the, the 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 wishes, the aspirations of the workforce and the management in Desi well. But it's but it'd be good to have it as, as an example. So, moving back to pre-pandemic elements, to use that language yet again, that have already been carried out in in Catalonia in the wake of the National Pact for Time Use Reform. Um, there was a very important space created there in the uh, Work Relations Council in 2016. Uh, there were 10 clear goals included, and uh, they were going to be the object of collective bargaining. Uh, Ultimately, all these measures need to be translated into um, real action uh, from the bargaining table to those who must implement the, the rules in, in, in labor courts and uh, etc. There are many other stakeholders involved uh, that need to be aware of that collective bargaining of those collective agreements and need to mm -hmm. know how to implement them. So at the Social Economic and Work Council we can talk about 
working days, working times and the periods of rest in between one working day and the next and the right of each worker to modify, to alter their working day to suit um, their needs. Those articles already existed. We, we can see clearly now the effect which that has on workers and their well-being. There is a greater need now for the, the force of workers, of employees, to be taken into account and to be heard so that workers can make their voices heard before their employers. Uh, not only when they are experiencing the need to have a break because of some health issue, but as a matter of course. And that's what we try to do when we carry out a collective bargaining process. And there are some issues uh, already contemplated in uh, regulations, but that do not find a direct implementation in real life such as the specific regulation of night shifts or night work and the digital the right to digital disconnection to name just a couple of examples we often talk about a, a right to disconnect a right to digital disconnection but we must uh, apply common sense to that companies can say all right let's talk about digital disconnection but what is going on now when everybody is over connects it even while they are in their place of work and here i must put my hands up i very often have facebook open while i am working and refer to it occasionally we do not fully disconnect and whoever says the opposite i'm afraid must be challenged as a bit of a liar because uh, i must admit and put my hands up that at one point or another the temptation to check if i have received any messages in one of my social media platforms appears. Um, I'm not saying this has to be put at the same level as the right to digital disconnection by any means, but we must also be aware of the overconnection we are all experiencing. Okay, so in, I have 10 seconds. Maybe we can continue uh, during this afternoon's debate, but we must mm, include, we must put on the table also what happens um, during the time that I take to get to my place of work and to get back home, the commuting time. We must, um, we must uh, try to achieve a more, a more intelligent type of mobility, of transportation. Um, that is extremely important too. And finally, when we talk about different work cultures, um, in a society like the one in which we live in. The value of work must be a reflection of the value of all types of work, not just paid work in a particular place of work, but also the work being done um, by volunteers, work being done in the social sector, etc. And that must all be taken into account. Thank you very much, Tony. We shall continue talking about uh, regulations and the need for agreements between uh, employers and employees, and social agents, social stakeholders. We are, I'd now like to give the floor to Manuela Geleng, Director of Jobs and Skills at the European Commission's Director General for Employment, Social Affairs and Inclusion. Good morning to you. Good morning. We're now going to broaden the f our view a slightly more to the European level. What are the challenges for work or for employment organization at the European Union? And what direction is the EU heading towards in this field? Good morning to all of you. Allow me to continue in English. My Spanish is not, it's not that brilliant. Thank you for inviting me to this uh, really uh, important event. Uh, it's, it's indeed a, a key issue, the time, uh, the way we use our time, we manage our time, we organize our time, and this defines both, it's a defining factor both for work and for our private lives. And clearly, as we have seen, uh, digitalization has uh, 
increased and decreased uh, our ability to control uh, our time. And in fact, we already saw before uh, the pandemic uh, that there was some uh, telework. We already saw that there was some blurring between work and private life. And Tony Moore just uh, spoke about that. And uh, we also saw that there are um, different uh, types of, of contracts uh, um, that have different um, models of, of part-time, uh, fixed term, and so on. Um, we also see that there are some forms of work, particularly through platform, that are managed where the, individual, where the person working on a platform is managed by a, an algorithm. And we also saw that before, um, already before the pandemic, nine to five was uh, not uh, demand for anymore for a, a working day for many, many workers already. Now, I think that the COVID has accelerated the pace uh, because if before the pandemic, there were more or less 5% uh, of people working in telework. Now, during the pandemic, it jumped to 37. And that's about the percentage that we think of are the jobs in Europe nowadays that can be uh, teleworkable. Uh, obviously, the same cannot be said for every country, because uh, obviously, the, the rate of, to which uh, telework is used in, in, in member states depends also on the economic structure. Uh, but also on, on the political choices and in the individual choices. So uh, now, what is what do we have in Europe? Let's start to say what do we have in Europe against uh, the background where we are today. First of all, we have a lot. Uh, we have already some important legislation in place. First of all, there is a framework a directive on uh, health and safety. Uh, and indeed, uh, it's still a good framework, which already covers many of the features, uh, addresses many of the features that we see uh, today. But indeed, when we launched the strategy of health and safety in June this year, that sh should bring us to uh, 2030, uh, a strong focus was also put uh, on the new forms of work and what it entails in terms of uh, physical and psychosocial impacts. Then uh, we have a working time directive, uh, which uh, um, has over the years, it stems from 2003, uh, proved to be a flexible uh, uh, instrument in allowing to uh, cope with the different uh, work uh, uh, organization uh, types. More recently, the union adopted uh, a directive on transparent and predictable working conditions. Uh, and a directive on work-life uh, balance. Nevertheless, uh, when we look at the new forms of work, after the pandemic, it's clear that uh, hybrid work is here to stay, uh, and that has positive, and, uh, positive aspects for work-life balance. It allows us to juggle our private life with our, our working life. It may also be positive for the environment because it allows, it takes away a lot of commuting that we had before the pandemic. And for uh, companies and also for uh, people, it uh, allows to look at the wider talent pool because you can think about people that do not live in your, in your area, but you through remote work, you can uh, bring in more people that live perhaps far, farther away. Now, this can also have uh, negative effects, obviously, because the work-life balance, the flexibility to organize your time should not lead to inequalities or uh, differences in appreciation of, uh, of your work. Uh, it should not have negative impact in terms of your health, your physical health, nor your uh, mental health. And it should not have an impact on, on gender, uh, on gen on gender. Hemos perdido el sonido ahora, ¿puede ser? 
Sorry, ah, sorry. <laughs> I, I hope I'm there. So I was saying that um, all um, needs to, all of these phenomena that we are living, experiencing now, that were there before, but through the pandemic became much more pronounced, and are probably here to stay. Need a careful analysis, and um, and this is why. And we will hear uh, later from. Um, the uh, from uh, Alex Saliba, uh, the honorable member of the parliament, um, uh, that uh, the parliament called on the commission to um, to uh, reflect on the a right to disconnect and on minimum uh, requirements for uh, remote work. And cl clearly, here uh, we are at the interface of technology, regulation, working conditions, and time use. And these are all central matters, indeed. And to address this, currently we are uh, we are launching an important study to look at these developments uh, in Europe across all member states in terms of uh, connecting and disconnecting, in terms of uh, um, remote work, and more globally the future of work what is what is new out there we will also have discussions uh, with the, with social partners because they play uh, an important role we will uh, organize a conference early next year to discuss precisely this uh, these aspects and um, we will also uh, uh, stimulate uh, discussions uh, with the with the member states we'll also look through a new implementation report at the Working Time Directive, how things have changed uh, in, uh, in the member states. Currently, um, the social partners are implementing a very important uh, framework agreement that they have introduced in 2020 on uh, digitalization, uh, which actually covers um, covers connecting issues of connecting and disconnecting and issues of of uh, of telework and clearly the commission is here to support uh, social uh, uh, social um, social partners uh, work and uh, and uh, while uh, we we support them we do these uh, these studies and these activities to get a better um, evidence base for potential uh, future policy policy making. Indeed, uh, perhaps just in conclusion, let me also uh, reflect on the fact that uh, in December this year we will come forward with a proposal on uh, on uh, platform work because we also see here uh, that. Um, uh, for the first time, we see uh, people that are not managed by a human, but by an algorithm. And so algorithmic management is an important aspect uh, in new forms, uh, new forms of work. But equally important with new forms of work is the ability of people to have the right skills. And therefore, the union has of late, uh, of late put a lot of focus on increasing uh, the digital skills of its population. We are not very good with digital skills, particularly the adult population. So there is really a, a strong effort to, to be made. And also in December, the Commission will come forward with a proposal on providing every um, individual the possibility to upskill and, and reskill. So I think with that, I would have finished uh, an overview of uh, what we have in the European Union and where we are going. It is clear that the European Commission is, uh, has their finger on the pulse and it's clearly on their agenda. We shall now say hello to Veronica Martinez Ladero, the Director, the General Director of Employment of the Government of Spain. Now that we have just heard what the European Commission has on their agenda, what they are working on, and what they are keeping their eyes on. We would like to know what are the trends here in Spain in terms of organizing employment currently. And obviously also what steps are being made by the Spanish government for their regulation of these new types of employment. First of all, I'd like to thank you for this invitation on behalf of the Ministry of Work 
it is an extremely interesting topic and we are working uh, we are working on this process and alongside the European Commission and other institutions. I'd like to start with a bit of a reflection uh, with, with some thoughts. In terms of organizing uh, our working time, we have certain lessons learned from the pandemic that we must not forget. Our understanding, our learnings are that what we learned from the pandemic, particularly at the start of it, was that the need, the need to reassess the link between our available time and working time, our free time and working time, with the requirement for redistributing uh, care work uh, with a gender perspective. Up to now, working work time has been considered from a perspective of uh, increasing flexibility without taking into account its implications in terms of gender the result of that has been a widening of the of the of the gap of the inequality uh, the gender inequalities between men and women and secondly when we talk about uh, work time uh, about the Work, the, the uses of uh, work time, this is a matter of health and well-being. The risks of this affect working women in particular, because any deficiencies in terms of core responsibility um, and an unequal distribution of work have a, a, a clear impact on women's health. We need to look ahead now to a post-pandemic scenario. What we are doing from our ministry is, well, we think that our legislation must break with the cycle of accommodating to uh, events. It is difficult to establish the, the reach of COVID. But what we are clear about is that uh, the structures that up until now had defined our legislation and how we organized our time, our work time. Well, currently, there was no room for a redistribution of work or considering work in terms of efficiency. And that should be a clear goal, uh, that that is a clear goal for our government. Legislation didn't even allow us to um, react to uh, negative contexts, such as the pandemic. Uh, and adapt quickly to them. We think we must now introduce certain measures to make some improvements in these areas um, without having a negative effect on other areas of this legislation. Um, some, need to be, some measures need to be further developed and others need to be created from scratch. And that's where I'd like to focus now. Uh, we are studying, we are, uh, there is a panel that is already working on this and I cannot be very specific on the content of this work out of respect for the panel who are still working on this issue, but there are some cross-sectional mm. issues that lead this government to agree with social agent and employment organizations and this is that any new measure needs to be negotiated and agreed upon. And also, we must be very strict with regulations in terms of equality. The most innovative uh, rules currently have to do with that, and they must be a paradigm for any agreement in terms of the reorganization of work time. And this is a road that needs to go in both, both ways. It needs to be a two-way road. And finally, the teleworking, legislation in teleworking. And this is where I'd like to uh, focus uh, next. The pandemic forced us to uh, give a preference to teleworking. 
uh, rather than any having any internal flexibility and as opposed to any and also in contraposition with any measure that was detrimental to employment teleworking had not been uh, greatly developed in our legislation it was considered something voluntary so what we did was to establish clearly these preferences and we our goal was to make this uh, legislation something a bit more solid uh, better developed um, teleworking was still something very new both in our country and in our en environment we tried to establish legislation where this adaptability was consolidated in our legislation. We did that via a teleworking law and I'd like to mention the three main principles of this law because they are very fitting for what we're discussing today. First of all, it is voluntary. It is flexible for both parties, employers and employees. Equality and collective bargaining in uh, setting any conditions, regulating uh, working time. I, I must mention something which has been very controversial lately. And I'd like to take this opportunity to clarify this point. In Article 13 of the workers' uh, regulations, work regulations we had article 5 that established that not volunt that um, teleworking was not voluntary and was linked to the company's needs well if anybody has any questions now about the relationship between teleworking and the pandemic it is now very clear that that was set aside it was no longer linked to well um, it was no longer a voluntary topic, a voluntary choice. So we are now able to determine after this clarification, I'd like to add that measures linked to that royal decree were determined by the strictest state of alarm we had during the pandemic, by the strictest state of alarm, which we have experienced uh, in the whole history of our democracy. It is therefore very difficult to understand that currently certain measures can still be justified um, when we are no longer in this under a strict state of alarm. Therefore, uh, that's why legislation has, uh, has had to catch up with developments. Yeah. Now, teleworking is also related to a gap in, in employment. The pandemic showed that both at a national and EU level, work can uh, be uh, can can heighten the the risk of inequality between men and women we must analyze or make sure we must prevent also um, the the reproduction of uh, inequalities and discrimination based on gender uh, Care work and domestic work relies heavily on women. And what we are seeing is that paid work and unpaid work at home um, add up to a very long working day. Telework can become a direct discrimination tool because we can perhaps assimilate telework with types of work that involve less commitment to the company that may uh, be detrimental to the advancement of, uh, 
of employers of employees um, careers and this may have a particular impact on women we need to therefore continue uh, investing in the development of uh, of services such as childminding services or elderly uh, citizens uh, care services. So what we often see is that what is a social uh, problem often ends up being a problem that is solved at a domestic level, at a family level, very often solved by women. Therefore, we must provide solutions to the particular risks associated to teleworking so that all the measures uh, included in our legislation apply equally to people working on-site as to people working off-site remotely. So regulation of telework rather than being a measure to uh, redress the balance between uh, work life and family life, it, ha it has sometimes ended up being quite the opposite. And we must be careful to uh, prevent this and make sure that there is no discrimination directly or indirectly as a result of this legislation. We understand that the way in which we organize our working time must be appropriate must take into account the care needs of our society away from gender stereotyping. So what must be done in order to achieve this is to include, take into account the traceability of the work times, the distribution of work times, the right to disconnection and the prevention of uh, risks associated to health and safety and also the, the opportunities of pr internal promotion in the company. I shall say this again uh, as this is the key issue for this uh, legislation all uh, with collective bargaining into place. Thank you ever so much for your uh, presentation. You've talked about uh, regulation of teleworking, what the law contemplates uh, concerning these risks involved, and one of them was the right to digital disconnection, the right to digital disconnection. And we're going to talk about that. Uh, when today we talked about that, Camilla Kling was talking about overcoming these uh, sort of 888 model and with the whole question of digital disconnection. Uh, the You can work anytime from any place. Uh, there's no physical working place anymore in many cases. That's an opportunity. It's an opportunity, but they're not uh, devoid of risks. And now we're going to talk with uh, Alex Akis, a member of uh, European Euro MP and a rapporteur of the Right to Disconnect, and he's going to discuss about what is happening in Parliament and what uh, uh, where we're at concerning digital disconnection and. Uh, all these regulations on what, what, where are we at? Thank you, Alex. Good morning. Are you there with us? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, and first of all, thanks for this invite. It's, it's really an interesting discussion because definitely we should um, uh, discuss the future of work, especially in the context of the digitalization. Also, with regards to the big developments that we had <clears throat> during the pandemic that we are living in right now. So, first of all, <clears throat> why do we need the right to disconnect? Why do we need also to work upon legislation to prepare our workers for the future? We need to do so because a number of realities that were already there for a number of years when it comes to how the world of work basically has uh, become revolutionized with digitalization. There are a lot of positive effects, and if it wasn't for digitalization, much more workers, thousands of workers throughout Europe would definitely have lost 
um, their jobs during the pandemic. So digitalization, the use of digital technologies has definitely a number of positive effects, a number of positive effects that were relevant and very clear during the pandemic. But again, when it comes to digitalization, digitalization is scalping a lot so that there is more flexibility on our workplaces. And definitely, uh, this would entail also to have also more work-life balance uh, for our workers. But, but there is a big but. And this is one of the most important aspects that the right to disconnect is basically targeting when it comes to, first of all, define what is the right to disconnect at EU level and also give a number of basic rights to our workers. So first of all, there were a number of critics of the right to disconnect, which were telling us, why do we need the right to disconnect when um, uh, the issues of disconnection are already being taken care of by a number of employers. Unfortunately, this is not the case for each and every worker. So first of all, you have situations where by today, there were recent developments in a number of member states. For example, in France, France was one of the pioneers when it comes to the right to disconnect. But again, in France, we are uh, not giving the right to disconnect to each and every worker. In Italy, we have the right to disconnect, which is given to a very small fraction of workers, which are which fall under the definition of smart workers. Then we had a very interesting development in Ireland, whereby all workers today, both uh, government workers and also um, workers which are not working in the private sector, have been granted the right to disconnect. And in Malta, my member state, the right to disconnect is being given only to government employees. So it's only uh, awarded to uh, the civil service in Malta. So even at member state level, uh, when it comes to how the right to disconnect is being defied, defined, how the right to disconnect is given, who basically is benefiting from the right to disconnect, there are a lot of differences. So to have a more horizontal application of the right to disconnect, so no one falls behind, we are, <laughs> as a European Parliament, we are saying that all those workers who have direct contact content contact with digital tools should basically um, uh, should basically use and have this right to disconnect and why do we need the right to disconnect we need the right to disconnect for a number of fundamental reasons first of all when it comes to <clears throat> safeguarding the occupational health and safety of workers because when and in the context that we are living, and even a statistic of Eurostat, a survey of Eurostat conducted during the pandemic, is showing clearly that those workers who are teleworking, flexi-working, are more prone to overwork. Therefore, it's really important to basically deal with these situations because ultimately these workers are, are also facing a part from issues of uh, not being remunerated for the work that they are doing. Uh, overwork is not remunerated, so they are not being paid for this overwork that they are doing. But there are there is a strong link between mental health issues and overwork. Therefore, the right to disconnect definitely should help us also to reduce one of the collateral effects of the COVID pandemic, which is another pandemic of mental health issues. So it's really important to uh, basically also protect the mental health of our workers vis-a-vis -vis also uh, having the right to disconnect. So this is also another important point that uh, was very strong during the negotiations and also discussions at parliament level. What has the European Parliament done? A number of months ago, in the beginning of, of this year, last February, we have voted upon a resolution and also a fully developed piece of legislation directive, basically to define and give a number of a minimum set of rights to each 
uh, and every worker when it comes to the recording of working time, when it comes also to a number of, 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 of um, minimum requirements that should be agreed also contractually between employer and employee, basically to be able to enforce uh, this right as much uh, as possible. We are also giving a lot of powers to social partners in this regard because, again, it, it is very difficult to have a one-size-fits-all right to disconnect, which is applicable without taking into consideration a number of requirements uh, that, that, that are peculiar to sectorial and also uh, to uh, national requirements throughout Europe. Therefore, social partners should and must play a very important role in setting up and agreeing on the right to disconnect, but they should and must do so in accordance with uh, the requirements emanating from Article 5, of the of the of the um, directive that we are basically uh, proposing, the legislation that we are moving forward, the number, the minimum requirements that each and every worker should basically benefit from. Apart from that, our concept of right to disconnect is not restricted, so it's, it should not be restricted to particular sectors, particular types of work. It should be given and enjoyed by each and every worker having contact, content, contact with digital tools, digital technologies. And I think also another important aspect of the legislation that we have moved forward, and also the resolution, is the protection of workers, basically, who try uh, to vouch uh, in favor of their right to disconnect. I think, and Veronica Martinez has also made this point, uh, it's useless to have a piece of legislation where, and at the same time workers would be afraid to move forward and when basically the right to disconnect is uh, not um, respected uh, out of fear of discrimination, out of fear that these workers would uh, be afraid that they would be losing upon a promotion, uh, that they will be losing their place of work. So it's really important that workers would be fully protected when they are using their right to disconnect. Therefore, we are also introducing the novel concept of the reversal of burden of proof. Therefore, when it comes to the right to disconnect and when there is prima facie evidence that uh, basically a worker has been discriminated because he has used or made use of his right to disconnect, then it should be the employer who should justify that no discrimination took place and not the employee who should uh, basically bring forward proof that discrimination in fact took place. So here again, we are increasing and moving forward another extra layer of protection. Basically, this is the proposal that we have moved forward from Parliament. Now, uh, what is the next step forward? Uh, this resolution and directive have been approved by the European Parliament. Now the ball rests in the Commission's court. Uh, we are uh, continuing to push uh, on the Commission to kickstart the process with, um, uh, with social partners at EU level, so that uh, basically a proposal would be would uh, be laid on uh, would be laid forward, so that basically our workers could benefit as soon as possible from the right to disconnect. The right to disconnect, I always like to say, is a piece of the puzzle when it comes to uh, a number of rights that we should and we must safeguard today uh, for uh, to, to, to protect our workers in the new realities, basically, that are evolving on a daily basis when it comes uh, to digitalization. Uh, we are also, as a European Parliament, pushing very hard when it comes to teleworking. Uh, again, uh, I liked hearing. Well, I liked hearing also Veronica Martinez's presentation of and what basically the Spanish government has been doing when it comes to teleworking, the voluntary nature of telework, which is also an important aspect that we are pushing forward as a European Parliament. It's really important, and we should look at the whole picture, and this should be the ideal situation throughout Europe that teleworking should be done on a voluntary basis. And also, a number of rights with at European level 
when it comes to uh, the, the framework agreement that we have uh, on telework. It's an outdated agreement. It is not, it is not protecting the workers enough when it, when it comes to the new realities that we are living in today during the pandemic and also post-pandemic, because definitely our world would, would never go with, especially the world of, of work, would not go back to how it was uh, previously before the start of the pandemic. So the realities of uh, the social experiment, basically, that we have lived during the pandemic, where for the first time, uh, millions of workers throughout Europe started teleworking when two years ago it was inconceivable for them to telework this shift, although it won't be as strong, as prominent as it was in the midst of the pandemic, the shift of flexi-work, teleworking, smart working will continue to be there. Therefore, the basic sets of rights, fundamental rights that traditional workers basically take for granted, uh, these realities should also be fully protected, fully respected for teleworkers. Therefore, uh, we should move forward also when it comes to updating our legislation, when it comes to teleworking, when it comes to giving um, extra uh, rights to teleworkers so that basically we won't end up with a superior and an inferior set of rights, a superior set of rights for workers who are basically working in the traditional ecosystem of work, traditional uh, way of work, and uh, workers who are using more digital technologies. They are teleworkers. There are there are platform workers who are also um, uh, who are also one of the priorities of the employment and social affairs and the first committee in the European Parliament and also the European Parliament per se. It's also another reality that we should protect. And again, uh, I think that this is the time and we should not continue to postpone uh, the discussions on these big questions so that ultimately we, we would um, strive towards having a level playing field, a set of rights whereby fundamental rights of workers are protected throughout for each and every worker throughout Europe. Um, muchas gracias. Um, queda claro pues que es una oportunidad y que hay que... It is clear that it's an opportunity that we must regulate uh, the, uh, and ensure that the changes be maintained and there be a level playing field uh, uh, between those who work face-to-face -face or uh, traditional working models and uh, remote ones. And we must look at examples. Uh, for instance, let us look at the question of the four-day week. What examples do we have? And what is being done right now? And uh, um, you know, Lockhart from the Four Week Global is going to look at practical uh, case studies. All right, uh, Charlotte, hello, Charlotte Lockhart. Necesitamos ejemplos. Queremos saber cómo funciona esto de la semana de los. Examples, concrete examples, concrete for the week. And what can you, what could you be you make? What can you tell us about that? On the world that are all reducing their work hours, whether that is by a four-day week or whether that is by working a thirty-two hour week. And it starts with the basic premise that it was, which I often say, is that we need to remember that we borrow our people from their lives. And so therefore, what we need to understand is where does fit work fit in context to our whole lives? Now, back when we brought uh, out the 40-hour work week, um, as uh, Camilla um, mentioned earlier on, uh, quite some time ago, over 100 years ago, our society was constructed very differently, and also so was our workplace. But now with all of the digital ways that we can work and the improvements of productivity that we have had in the last 100 years, we need to shift the balance of work 
and we need to shift the benefits of that productivity. And so lots of companies around the world, and there are thousands of them, uh, are actually shifting to working out that they can be just as productive, if not more productive, by working less. And it's this unlocking of the productivity that makes it so important. And it fits very much onto the digital, the, 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 the right to switch off conversation, where we've stopped working from home and we're now sleeping at work. And we need to be very careful as employers. And so we might put in rules about the right to, to disconnect and we might put in legislation or laws that will give us the right to disconnect. But at its heart, as employers, we should be looking to how do we enable our people to disconnect? And so when we talk with companies about how they can reduce their work hours, we talk to them about how they actually frame productivity in their business. And when you have a clear idea of what your job role in your business is and how that productivity can be gained and can be increased, then actually you can be very clear about the time that you're doing that in. And so therefore, with your employer's permission and with the work that you do as a whole, you're actually looking at how, we, how disruptive work is in our lives. By setting those parameters, and it's, so it's a great, um, great exercise for a business to go through to be clear about what is our productivity? Why are we here? And so then when we're clear about that, we know that we can reduce the amount of time that digital disruption is affecting our lives. When we constructed our 40 hour week, if you remember, we didn't have cell phones and, and um, uh, laptops and we didn't have the internet and we didn't have all of that disruption. Structure our family holidays around whether we could find Wi Fi or not. And so, what we need to understand is what is the society that we want and what is the workplace that we want. And how are we going to use all of that to help us save the planet as well? So it's really important for us to actually understand that reducing work hours is entirely possible. And it could be a four day week, or it might be five days, but six hours a day, or it might be any combination of those because businesses need to make sure they remain profitable as we crawl our way out of this economic challenge that we will have post pandemic we need to make sure that we're not reducing productivity we need to, our businesses to continue to be a successful we need them to continue to be productive because we need the taxes that will come from all of that to help us climb our way out of all of this we need business to be successful because we need the income that will come from that. We need the employment that will come from that. So when, we're, when we talk about reducing work hours, we're talking about it in isolation with a company's productivity. And so we have a principle that we call the 180-100 rule. So we encourage businesses to pay 100% of income their people will work 80% of the time, but recognizing that we need 100% of the productivity that we had. And so by focusing in on that principle, you actually then can take into account staff who work too many hours, staff who work 40 hours, and then, and, but also your people who are already perhaps working a shorter work week. And so it's, a, it's been about being very clear about how we don't reduce income, but we can increase productivity. We look at examples that we find um, that are well known that you, you know, that you will have heard of before with the Microsoft and Japan trial. They reduced down to four days a week and they increased their productivity by 39.9, so nearly 40%. 
And they did this by doing three very simple things. They asked people to have no more than five people in meeting, had their meetings no more than 30 minutes, and to use more Microsoft Teams. So use the more technology that was widely available. And let's face it, they were Microsoft, so Microsoft Teams would be one thing you'd expect them to use. So they did those three things. What's not so widely um, reported is they did three things outside of work as well. So they asked their people to think of something they would do for themselves, something that they would do for their family, and something that they would do in their community. Because then when we're looking at what is it that our lives are when we talk about you know, when we talk about the old 40 hour week, where we're talking about eight hours of work, eight hours of play, eight hours of rest, what we're doing is we're recognizing that we have this time that's outside of work. But as we, our lives have become more digitized, those lo the line between work and, uh, and play has become so blurred that they're almost intertwined. And through the pandemic, we hear stories about companies doing their best to stay engaged with their staff and looking at doing things like yoga in, at, you know, at work with their, your people. But the question I have for you is, does yoga have a place at work rather than a place that you should be, that's something you should be doing with your friends, be doing it outside of work? And so we've slid not just even digitally but we've blurred the lines between what work should be involved with in our business and our, what work should be involved with in our lives and where work really should just be work and when we're clear about what our productivity is it's easier to identify that it's easier to put the boundaries around it it's easier to understand what are the things that we should be doing that are outside of that and when we encourage our people to think of things that they will do if they have spare time, then that gives them the opportunity to value that time. And so it's important. We, we know all of the reasons, you know, the family reasons, the, the health reasons, the environmental reasons, the gender balancing reasons. All of these are so well known already. What we need is for businesses to decide to take a bold move with it. So at Four Day Week Global, what we do is we support companies that want to take that step. We show them how they can focus in on productivity, we help them switch from being a company that values time as a way of measuring our, what we do in a work in a, a workplace. So what happens is time gets confused for productivity. And so people who come to work for long hours are determined as being more productive, but they're not. And we know this, and there's lots of research and lots of studies that will expect, that say that the amount of work that we do now isn't fit for purpose. And so I it's actually not that hard it's a case of going with your people on a journey and saying let's work out how we can do this in less time and let's be the company that does that because there are companies that are in competition with you there are companies that are doing it already and they are looking to att attract and retain the best staff that are out there. They're looking to create a workplace that is not only productive, but it is the place that everyone wants to come and work at. When we introduce it into our company in Perpetual Guardian, can I tell you, we're a really boring company. Perpetual Guardian is a business, and we're, we're a legal services business. It's not a very sexy part of legal services either. And so people don't wake up in the morning and say, I want to go work for a trustee company. But they now want to come and work for us because they've seen that we are a company that is innovative and that treats their people well, but also wants to be very clear about its purpose. 
And that's what we are all looking for as companies is what is our purpose? And so we can be mindful of all of that. We can be purposeful as we move forward into the 21st and century and beyond. And we can take the world on a journey. It's a journey where our people have the right amount of work and the right amount of being able to play. So I encourage you all to remember that we borrow our people from their lives. Thank you, Charlotte. Um, este mensaje de, de ánimo, ¿no? Nos anima. Thank you, Charlotte, for your encouraging message. It encourages us to break many boundaries and many barriers, mental barriers, regarding the type of work, productivity, our relationship to our employer. This is all to do very much with core responsibility and mutual trust. I think we've come to the end of our time, this session. All the views heard have been extremely interesting. And as a wrap up uh, thought, I think we all agree that the pandemic has uh, placed us at the center of a changing scenario. We must now keep working to make sure that we don't miss the train. This train of opportunity to reassess our how we relate to our uh, to our work time. Legislation is extremely important. A lot of progress is being made there. And also our, mon our mentality. Um, Camilla Crane gave us some very interesting tips on that. And uh, even um, uh, terms such as uh, discrimination, biological discrimination. So thank you all very much. It is already 1 p.m. We have run out of time. It has been extremely interesting to listen to all of you. And I think we now have a clearer idea of the path ahead of us. We are also very clear that you are all working uh, to move, make progress along that path. Thank you all very much.